Hi guys, Dr. Dillard. All right, we're getting ready for the dreaded prostate exam. This lab, I mean the time, the 45, 50 minutes we have, will be consumed by preparation for this. In fact, this usually is, takes me two lectures to do this. It's 80 slides, although there's a lot of pictures. Uh, so this may count for GIGU Monday and GIGU Tuesday. And then we'll actually do the demonstration on Thursday of our three-hour block. Uh, that'll take, well, that demonstration won't take that long. Um, so let's see, though. Let's see. Let's see where we end up on this thing. I'll actually note the time so I actually will keep track of my time this time. Let's see where we get to. All right, so prostate. So digital rectal exam, often called the DRE or digital rectal exam or rectal exam. It involves an examination of the perineal region or the perineum, the anus, the rectum, and that's it for males and females. But if you're a male, you go one step further. Or maybe if you're a male, you just want to do the prostate exam. So pr males have a prostate. Females don't have a prostate. Okay, basic anatomy review here. I'm sorry, we, it's pouring rain over here. So you might hear some, our drains, our gutters are noisy. Sorry about that. Uh, basic anatomy review. Here we go. We did this right an hour before. So this is the perineal region. It's often called the bike saddle area or the saddle area. And it's made up of two triangles, right? The urogenital triangle. Uh, here's the issue of tuberosities. If I drew, and this drawing's off a little bit. But issue of tuberosity, if I drew a line between here where these... Uh, this forward, that would be the urogenital triangle. And this triangle here, it's actually two urogenital triangles. And this triangle back here would be the anal triangle. So together, most authors agree this is the perineal region. So you want to inspect that for any, any masses or rashes or anything weird looking. Okay, uh, I should note that who supplies the skin over most of this region it is the peroneal nerve in its various divisions. There's a, a dorsal penis, penal branch, which isn't uh, in this region, but there's a perineal branch and there's a rectal branch. Oh, you can actually see it. What am I talking about here? We can actually see right here the inferior anal branches of the pudendal nerve. Uh, and here is a superficial perineal branch of it. And there's a deep perineal branch of it. And this one's going so deep, it's actually ended up toward the penis. That's the dorsal nerve of the penis. So this is a very important, important nerve. The borders of the perineal region, that might be a good question because it's got three answers. Coccyx, that's the border back here, coccyx. Uh, and then the issue of tuberosities would be here and here. And then we have the symphys pubis, which would be right up here. And remember, we, we learned all the muscles here. I won't go through all those again, but here's the male and female, a little bit different, uh, right? There's the per perineal membrane. Remember, that was always confusing. Uh, the space above, like all this stuff, if I scraped all this stuff off above this membrane, that's the superficial perineal pouch. If, if I scrape the membrane off and go deep to this, that's the deep perineal pouch. That's always confusing. That's all we'll say about that. Just some more basic anatomy. So here's the, the rectum, uh, the anus. You go through the anus. The anal canal is right here. Uh, the anus is just the part that you can see here on the very end. And the rectum is this. It attaches to the sigmoid colon, which is m more S-shaped in this photo. But I just wanted to remind you that there is a visceral peritoneum that lines all this stuff. And visceral peritoneum has a pouch right here, the pouch of Douglas. And there's also a vesicular uterine pouch in the front. But this is more of a potential space. It's really not clinical. This one can flew up. Let's see. Did I... 
Oh, I didn't turn on my markers. Uh, this one can fill up with fluid. Uh, so you could actually take a needle and you could drain this and see if there's cancer cells or you can see what kind of stuff is in here. You can get at that through the rectum. Uh, so that's the pouch of Douglas, a.k.a. rectouterine pouch. Is there a prostate here? Prostate would be right here. No prostate in females. Here it is in guys, though. So here's the perineal region again. There's the anus and rectum. And there's the prostate right there. You can see it's very, very close to the anterior part of the, the rectum. And that's what we're going to be palpating by. There's the old borders of the prostate. We just covered this in a lecture before. The neck of the urinary bladder right up here. That's the superior portion. Symphys pubicis is the anterior border. Down here, you could say the deep perineal pouch. You could say the external urethral sphincter is in the deep perineal pouch, or even the perineal membrane. That's not a great one because that would be down here, only much thinner. All right, so this is kind of what we're going to do. We're not. We're going to use a full rubber glove, not a finger cot, though. But this picture worked pretty good for my Photoshop skills here and we're going to stick our finger in there and we're going to feel the posterior surface of this prostate to make sure there's no lumps or bumps or weird feelings or any juice coming out of this that's not supposed to. We're going to feel for these seminal vesicles which we should never ever be able to to feel unless they're gigantically swollen with cancer um, then it would be it would be really bad of course. Right. We saw this picture before. This is de nonvilliers. De nonvilliers fascia is what we're actually palpating through. Our finger would be right here, palpating. The nail would be here, the nail plate. Okay, remember there's a right lobe, a left lobe, and a right lobe. And then there's a medium, kind of a sulcus right here talked about that before. Okay, let's go to the anus. It's often, in most of the texts, pathology texts, call it the, the anal uh, ver, uh, verge. Anal verge, like ver, ber, it's called out. J, or like merge, vernal uh, verge. The anal verge. Some people just call it the anus, which is much simpler, but I can see them asking you the anal verge just to make sure uh, or the anal orifice, and that's all it is. It's the hole, the visible hole that we can see. Uh, it is, or the opening to the anal cavity is called the anal verge. Uh, it's, or you could say it's the distal end of the anal cavity. The tissue, we can inspect the tissue around the anal verge. It should be moist, it shouldn't be all cracked and dried. It should be hairless and non-tender to palpation. And yeah, the the intestinal type tissue with the mucosal lay layer will die out at the intest at the anal verge. It becomes stratified regular squamous, but not part of a, muco a mucous membrane. Right here, so there's gonna and again. I apologize. I can't see these pictures. There's gonna be some gross pictures coming, uh, but I can't see them ahead of time, so I can't warn you. Uh, but yeah, this is the anus or the anal verge, if you will. And perineum is out here, and you can see this is still kind of a mucosal tissue, but it morphs into a regular old. If this is still stratified squamous, though. Uh, the, the epithelial layer is stratified squamous, but it's still mucosa. It has mucosal glands and things like that. But as you, you go away from it, it turns into the, the regular run-of-the-mill stratified squamous. Uh, it's created by, what's this tightness created by? An internal and external sphincter for the most part. Right? So the anal verge leads to the anal canal. And it's a short region between the anus, or anal verge, and the rectum. It uh, specifically begins at the anal rectal junction and ends at the anal verge. And it has muco. It's just like the intestinal tissue we've talked about. It has the mucosal layer, the submucosal layer, uh, the mucosae external layer, and the serosal layer, just like all the layers before. It's starting to kind of toward the distal part. It's starting to change though. Uh, the 
The walls of the anal canal are made of internal and external sphincters. Take a look at those here. There's a nice little cartoon of it. So here's the, uh, this from here to here is the anal canal. And you can see the walls are very thick and there's an internal anal sphincter and an external anal sphincter. External anal sphincter actually, or the internal anal sphincter actually morphs from circular muscle. Remember there's longitudinal and circular of the muscularis, or of the uh, muscularis externa. It has two layers, a circular and a longitudinal. So the longi so the circular actually morphs into this internal anal sphincter. The external anal sphincter morphs from the levator ani muscle. Okay, but the you really important, right? These these guys will be it won't look like this. These this thing will be pinched in like nothing, so fecal material doesn't get out uh, because of the pressure. These things are normally in a resting state. They're contracted. Remember the internal anal sphincter. Do you have control over that? No control. That's completely voluntary. And if fecal material comes and pushes into this, it will relax. No, and you don't have. You can't control it. But you can feel like you have to go to the bathroom, number two, and you can offset that by compressing or by physically. These are not, I mean, these are voluntarily controlled. These are involuntary internal. Externals are voluntary. So you can push down and you can squeeze that fecal material back out of the area and it'll stop stimulating the parasympathetic system. You remember that from physiology. I won't go into the defecation reflexes. Uh, the anal sphincters, again, the internal anal sphincter is under involuntary control. Everything I kind of said contributes to about 80% of the resting tightness of the anal sphincters. So it's the main one that controls continence, not incontinence. We know what incontinence is, right? That's when you lose control of bowel or bladder. Fecal incontinence is when you're you're accidentally pooping in your pants or you have diarrhea coming. You can't hold it anymore. That's incontinence. Continence means you're, you are holding it in. Who is in control of continence for the most part? That's the internal anal sphincter. Uh, parasympathetic, innervated. It's got some, another reflex, a short reflex that's, that comes from Arbox plexus. So it's double innervated. Both A and S, this is, this is completely autonomic nervous system innervated. External anal sphincter, we said, is under voluntary control, uh, specifically from the branches of the pudendal nerve. If you want to get really specific, there's a rectal nerve uh, that innervates it. Contributes 20% to the, the closing, the natural closing of the anal canal. What keeps the fecal material from coming out? Well, there's three key muscles. We just talked about the the anal sphincters, but there's another one. Now, they didn't have us go deep enough in anatomy. Maybe they did in class, but remember, levator ani is broken into three parts. One's really important. The one that's the most anterior is the puborectalis muscle. Puborectalis. Okay, puborectalis muscle. Um, that one's a really, really interesting muscle, but that does uh, help kind of kink the, the rectum so fecal material won't as easily get, get out when that muscle is engaged. Fecal incontinence, as we just said, that's the involuntary passing of fecal material through the anal canal and out. And it could be real fecal material, it could be diarrhea, it could be you know, mixtures in between, but it's a problem, it's an embarrassing problem. Typically strikes middle-aged women who have had kids, uh, and all man and, male and female, older people have this problem. The population prevalence of this condition is at least 2%. I've seen some estimates of up to 10%. But it's so embarrassing that most people, when they get a survey, they don't want to admit that they're having this type of trouble. 
What causes it? It's usually multifactorial. It's very rarely just one problem. Uh, so therefore, it's difficult to treat as well. Uh, but here are some of the common causes. Females, well, how come females are so affected? But especially ones who have given birth, uh, they injure, they have vaginal injuries from having that baby pass through, right? Uh, because the baby comes out of the, the vagina, but the, the rectum is right behind and it gets smashed uh, by the baby coming out. And so you can damage the peroneal nerve. You can get a neuropathy following this. Uh, people or women who have needed uh, an episiotomy from a tearing of the vagina after they gave birth are also at risk. Some, that means that the force was enough to rip the vagina. It was probably enough to damage the peroneal nerve. And forceps probably means the head was really big and that's enough to damage. All of these tend to come back to some kind of damage to the peroneal nerve. But the weird thing is usually they have, women have their babies, you know, 20s, maybe 30s. Uh, but why does the problem not strike until the 50s of age? So we don't understand why there's that delay. And then we said men and women just aging. I mean, we've talked about GERD, how aging, just all the muscles just get weak and they tendons dry up and get brittle and uh, sphincters get loose like the lower esophageal sphincter. And so the same thing can happen here. That puborectalis muscle can become weak and you really need this muscle to keep fecal material from invading that uh, the anal canal. And the last one is any type of surgery, but even simple hernia or hemorrhoid surgery, those people have an increased risk for developing fecal incontinence later in life as well. Here's, if you don't remember this from anatomy, here's this really interesting puborectalis muscle and it forms a lasso at the junction, even lower this, where the where the anal canal meets, oops, I went too far, where the anal canal meets the rectum, you have a sling of tissue that has a tone and it causes a bending of the rectum like this because of that. And this puborectalis connected to the symphys pubis and then it, it's like a wishbone. It has another part connected to the coccyx. Uh, so yeah, that's an important kind of preventer or, or safety mechanism so you don't become incontinent. It's also interesting too because it's not innervated like the pudendal nerve, uh, like the external anal sphincter is. It's innervated by S3 and S4 spinal nerves. It's a, some, um, yeah, S3 and S4 spinal nerves. There are some exercises that you can do to strengthen this muscle for people who are have fecal incontinence. Um, that would be really easy exercise, sim to, similar to a Kegel exercise. You just have the patient sit there and then you say, okay, pretend you're having diarrhea and now squeeze and prevent that diarrhea from coming out hard and hold it. That's exercising all the, the external anal sphincter and the puborectalis muscle. Okay, and then there's different types of exercise. You can do maybe five sets of hold as long as you can. And then you can do some medium ones where you don't hold, like you hold medium power. And then you can do some fast ones where you hold fast and release fast. There's different ways to, to exercise it. There's some research that shows it does help. I'm sure they'll teach you that in the upper quarters. Um, here's just a, another cartoon. It's kind of cool. There's that pubal rectalis kind of sling around there and here's a piece of fecal material and the patient is going to the bathroom because this is invading the poop has invaded the anal canal and uh, the pubal rectalis muscle is now relaxed to allow that to happen and remember all those reflexes you learned in physiology there's double physiological reflexes that cause a relaxing of the ex, the internal, the powerful internal anal sphincter has to be relaxed. Most of it is a parasympathetic reflex that has it relaxed. Right, there's just another view we've seen before. Levator ani right there. And yep, external anal sphincter here, internal anal sphincter. 
So all this property here. You can see how the internal internal anal sphincter, see how it just morphed from run-of-the-mill circular muscle? Here's the circular muscle that we already know, and there's the longitudinal muscle of the uh, of that uh, of that intestinal wall. Yeah, you can see the these. We'll look at these when we talk about hemorrhoids here in a bit. But yeah, there's the anal canal. Uh, there's the there's another pectinate line or the dentate line, uh, which is the the junction between the rectum and the anal canal. All right, uh, the rectal the rectum. Then what does it connect to? Well, we know. Where's a picture? It connects. Uh, I got one coming. It connects to the sigmoid colon, and it starts approximately at the level of the S3 vertebrae according to Standring, has three or four transverse ridges in it to increase the surface area a bit. Those are called the valves of Houston. Here's a nice picture. There's the sigmoid colon. There's the rectum. There's the valve of Houston, also called transverse folds. This one has three of them. Yep, that's the rectum. All right, so that's our little our little anatomy review just out of curiosity I wonder how long I guess I should could start my uh, timer couldn't I that's like 20 minutes all right let's go for it rectal exam all right equipment you will need make sure when we do this makeup make sure you bring a latex glove because you do not want to stick your hand into the model without one of those things it's uh, kind of gross from all the quarters. Try to clean them out the best we can, but they are they definitely want a rubber glove or latex glove. You're going to use some lotion. I will supply that. You don't have to worry about that. If you're doing it for real, though, uh, some Vaseline would work just fine. Uh, you want some drapes. You can drape the patient. You want a pen light. When you look between the, uh, the gluteal folds, you want to look for pinworms and things like that. You need a light to flash in there. And you want a fecal occult blood test nearby if you want to do that because this is a great chance when you do this exam, you're always going to get a little fecal material on your finger and you can just scrape it right in that container for the fecal blood test and you can either do it in your office or send it off. Remember, this is very embarrassing, so you want to act very professional here, try to use a soft voice and calm voice so the patient doesn't get nervous use a light touch don't be rushed don't be in a hurry they'll uh, make them more nervous and they I mean if they if they don't want you to they can stop you from doing this exam uh, by contracting their the external anal sphincters although with Vaseline I bet they probably couldn't come to think of it so I'm thinking of body cavity searches by prisoners and stuff. They probably just probably stop them. So you could probably overpower, but you don't want to do that, right? Because you could rip something down there. So there's different positions. This is, I mean, I've had these these done. These are the positions that uh, they always use. Uh, they're very comfortable. Unfortunately, this is not a very cool position I don't think but nevertheless this is the way most prostate models are so this is the position our prostate model will be in okay it's called the knee chest position uh, you want to drape everything except the perineal region uh, here's the other key I asked this question a lot of people got this even though they did it uh, you're gonna put your glove on the non-dominant hand so you can still do things with your right hand, like write notes down, uh, or you can, or you can glove both hands. How about that? If you want, but you you're going to want to keep that hand free to write with, and maybe get the fecal blood occult blood test ready with your dominant hand. So this is going to be done with your left hand. All right. So step one is inspection of the perineum. So we're going to inspect the perineal region. We'll inspect the ural, uh, the urogenital triangle for any skin cancer, any rashes, uh, any warts, and we're going to do the same for the anal triangle. Right? Remember these muscles? There's the superficial transverse perineal muscle. 
if you went down under this, there'd be a deep transverse perineal muscle. And here's the, the muscle, the borders of the triangle. Here's the ischial cavernosus. There's the bobospongiosis. That's right here. Right, that makes that urogenital triangle. And there's the perineal membrane right there. Remember, if we go deep to that, you're in the deep perineal pouch. Right now, we're in the superficial perineal pouch, everything above this membrane. All right, I thought I wasn't going to do that, but I did it anyway. Well, then we might as well do back here. What about what makes this triangle? We usually use the... Uh, the iliococcygeus part of levator ani, or you could use gluteus maximus. That's kind of the back borders of the anal triangle. And then the triangle, kind of the base of the triangle, would be the same superficial and deep transverse perineal muscles. All right, there's a real perineal triangle there, or urogenital triangle in the front, anal triangle in the back. All right, so what are we looking for? Everything I said, lumps, bumps, varicose veins, skin tags, things projecting. We'll look at an elephant ear here in a minute. Um, some of these skin tags could be secondary to lymphedema. Truck drivers and people who sit a lot without brakes are prone to get these things. People with Crohn's disease are also particularly susceptible to these uh, it, in fact, some of the first presentations of Crohn's disease could be seen by a simple uh, rectal exam. Okay, sorry about that. Little water break there. All right. In fact, these these skin tags are seen in 40% of people with Crohn's. That's a big, that's a big number, right? Um, so let's look at we look for hemorrhoids as well. There's an internal hemorrhoid. We'll look at the uh, the venous system that causes this, but there's an internal plexus here which can just like varicose veins we've talked about before. Uh, if the blood gets stuck in there and can't get out, it'll uh, it'll blow the uh, distend that vein like crazy until the point it breaks. A lot of times you'll have one of these things and uh, you'll get a really big bowel movement pushed through here and it'll rupture the hemorrhoid and you'll bleed a bright red blood and that'll be the end of it until the next time it occurs. Uh, internal, or there's an external hemorrhoid, sorry, that's an internal hemorrhoid there. They're usually farther up, but they, they can we'll sh show you some gross pictures. Oh, here it comes, the gross picture. So these are actually internal hemorrhoids and external hemorrhoids uh, that why someone would let it go this long, I just don't know, but they did, and that's pretty gross. Okay, here's what a an elephant's ear looks like in a patient with Crohn's disease. And they, for whatever reason, they think that looks like an elephant's ear, so I don't know about that. But nevertheless, common in people with Crohn's disease. Uh, inspection, so you can have, uh, what else can you have down there? You can have skin, rashes, scars, infections, can, uh, can, candida you can have down there. Um, you can have pinworms in kids with, classically they start complaining that their butt itches like crazy, especially at night, and it's a common problem. Uh, candida. So this is a patient with HIV and Crohn's disease at the same time, and he's got a candida infection here, and he's got an elephant ear. He's got Crohn's disease on top of that. What do you think that is? Well, I kind of told you, didn't I? That's a pinworm. See it right there? So that's why you need that pen light to look for these things. The usually best time to look for these is when the child is... Uh, been sleeping in early in the morning or right before they go to bed. If the child's active, they tend to crawl up in there and hide, but they come out late at night. Uh, more thorough inspection, so you should spread the cheeks apart. If they have a little obese, you might need to pull them apart because you got to be able to look in there to see this stuff. Okay, what's the option? I mean, do chiropractors really do this stuff? 
You're going to be licensed to do it if you want, but who could you refer these people to? Someone who specializes in the stuff, proctologist, right? Yeah, I would refer to the proctologist. Let them be responsible for this stuff, unless you want to. I mean, if you're up in Alaska and there's no one around or you're out in the stick somewhere, you might have to do this. Simple prostate, I don't have any problem with prostate portion of this the exam because that's so easy. You could save someone's life from that, but I don't know. In litigious California, I'd be a little leery of a chiropractor doing any of this stuff, honestly. Just my opinion. Those are not the opinions of anybody else, just me. Send them to a proctologist, though, if you're worried about it. Uh, anyway, we'll look at some of these fistulas and fissures. Um, yeah, let's look at some of these in a sec. Uh, also, got to look for this condyloma acuminata. Those are anal warts. The most common sexually transmitted disease nowadays. It's caused by the HPV virus, human papilloma virus, and uh, it can be cause a wicked inflammation so it can become quite painful and it does slightly not hugely but it does increase the risk for the later development of anal rectal cancer so this is not the greatest one in the world uh, to catch Let's take a look at it this is probably a gross picture coming there's classic anal warts condyloma acuminata Okay, here's the fistulas are interesting. I don't know if they don't have, none of our grandkids have ever had an ant farm. We have 11 grandkids. So I, I figure they don't make ant farms anymore. Uh, but ant farms look kind of like this. You have these tunnels. If this would be upside down, this would be the surface. You have ants coming out and doing their daily activities, but they go back into these tunnels. And these they're not ants, but their bacteria can cause these tunnels, and the bacteria can eat a hole right through here and come out on the surface. And when we have a connection between a tube and another tube or outside world, that's a fistula. And then if the tube doesn't end anywhere, that's called a fissure. So here's an anal fistula. Here's an anal fissure. What are they caused by? Usually staph or strep are usually staph, staph aureus bacteria, but there's different bacteria. Dr. Doe probably talked about them. Um, but yeah, so those are fistulas. Be on the lookout. Uh, they, if they've been there a long time, they can have a big party house here, and they can have, it can cause an abscess, and that this abscess can actually eat its way out through. You can start to see a white pus here on the top of this abscess, and there's another peri anal fistula and there's more of them there uh, why fistulas because we have a tube connected to a tube or I guess that's still they're still calling that one a fissure it would have to connect to the outside world uh, but yeah ant farm so here is proper draping for someone and you can see this big bump that turned out to be a perianal fistula and they have to cut this terrible they have to cut it out and put gauze in there and drain it and oh it's pretty gross what else is the matter with this person is if they don't have enough problems pretty bad hemorrhoids too right those are hemorrhoids all right palpate the anal canal all right now we're finally getting to the palpation part so let's go into that now remember to warn the patient this is it, it's that when you put your finger in the rectum, it's going to give them a sense that they have to defecate. I mean, that's what a suppository, you guys know what suppositories are? Uh, kids who are really constipated, you can put a suppository uh, in their anal canal and it, it stimulates that parasympathetic reflux to start peristalsis all the way up from the, the descending colon. And it'll start wringing the fecal material out pretty hard. So that works pretty good. Uh, but your finger is going to be like a suppository. So it's going to, they're going to feel like they have to go to the bathroom. And that's completely normal. So preparing for the entry, you want to lube up your index finger uh, with some Vaseline. Or we're using lotion in class. 
and uh, you're going to do your index finger. Let me repeat, you will do your index finger is what's going in there, not your thumb, not your pinky, not your middle finger, your index finger. And you want to explain the patient, okay, here we go, and just don't jam your finger in there. Put it on the anus first and get them, let them get used to that. And you can kind of um, let them get used to that before you go in. Make sure they get relaxed. Don't try to push it in there when they're not relaxed because if they're tense, it might hurt them a little bit because their external anal sphincters are still contracted. And their internal anal sphincters are always contracted, right? The only time those are not is when they have fecal material in there. Okay. All right, so there's a pitcher. He's kind of putting the finger right there, uh, letting the patient get used to it. Okay, Mr. Bill, you ready? Here we go. Please try to relax when I do this. And when you when you start the exam, you're just going to put your finger in to the anal canal this far. That's it. You're not going to jam it all the way in there because you want to inspect this anal canal. I mean, this is easy because we can see the anal canal. Um, but you c we don't have a camera in there. Um, so we're going to have to use our fingers to feel inside here for any fissures or warts or varicose veins or cancerous nodules. All right, so here we go. After long last, it is time for entry. And so you are going to slowly slip your lubed up index finger into the anal canal, but only about a half an inch because we're just going to explore the anal canal. Don't slide it all the way in there yet. We're not to that part. So just about that far up to your distal, your dip, distal and phalangeal joint. Okay, are we good with that? Okay, now what do you do when you're in there? Well, the first thing you do is just stop and just make a note of the resting tone. So when you have your finger in there, the internal anal sphincter is going to be naturally constricted. All right, so it should feel a little tight on your finger. Okay. So if it's not tight, you can start to worry. Or if it's too tight, you start to worry. So people with Crohn's disease, it's an inflammatory process that it's attacked the, the intestinal wall. And that includes the anal canal wall, and it can get inflamed, full of fluid and full of scar tissue, and it can make the, the anal canal too tight on your finger. So that's a common cause of an anal canal that's too tight. Muscular dystrophy, Hirschsprung's, Hirschberg's disease, this can also uh, cause an anal canal that's too tight. People who have had chronic diarrhea, Diarrhea can be quite acidic, and it can burn and cause chronic inflammation of the anal canal, and it can get scarred up just like Crohn's disease, so it might be too tight. Uh, people might have scar tissue from a prior uh, removal of hemorrhoids called a hemorrhoidolectomy or hemorrho hem hemorrhoidectomy. And so that's an impossible cause. What about things that are too loose? Someone comes in with really bad bilateral leg pain and and says, you know what, I've, I'm having trouble going to the bathroom. And you know, well, you can send them to the ER and be done with them right there. That's called equine and that needs to be ruled out. But if you're out in the woods in Alaska, what are you going to do? And you don't have anywhere to send them. Uh, you can do a rectal exam. And if if these symptoms match, uh, if you go in there and they're, they have no tone, there's nothing clamping on your finger at all, the internal urethral sphincter is shot. They need, you need to fly them out of the bush or wherever you are to a hospital. Then. That's a medical emergency. What else can loosen up the sphincter? Multiple sclerosis. Early MS is notorious for doing this. And then caudoquina syndrome from a big disc herniation or aneurysm or something that's crushing the thecal sac. Okay, what about some findings, especially uh, or when you're in there, we're still in the anal canal. Uh, what if it's really, really tender? They might have an anal fistula 
or might have an anal f fissure that you can't see yet. If they're extremely tender, the exam's over. It shouldn't hurt them that much. Uh, so then they might need to get some other testing or send them to a proctologist at that point for sure. Maybe you can feel a bump and it's a hemorrhoid. So make note of that. You're going to have to send them to the proctologist then. Uh, an inflammation, we said that. Maybe they've, maybe they've had anal sex and they're just really sore from that. Uh, so, but if they have t extreme tenderness, you can't, uh, you can't go further. What else could you find? Uh, special, especially well, not so much in this day and age, but they used to prescribe opioids like crazy, and people would be crazy constipated. You might stick your finger in there and run right into a chunk of fecal material, and so that's possible as well. Right. So, too much pain, you have to stop right there. If you're good and they don't have too much pain, you can proceed with the exam. Uh, so the next step is to rotor, kind of rotate your finger back and forth and back and forth uh, to feel. Because remember, you can't, you can't feel anything with the nail part of your finger. You're feeling with your finger pad, so you need to rotate that finger pad around to make sure you're not missing anything. Right? So rotate. Maybe there's a cancerous tumor up here, and you had your finger in the other way, and you couldn't feel it with your nail, but when you rotated it, you could feel it. So don't forget to rotate the finger. All right, and now you want to test their ability to clamp down on your finger. Um, so you can just tell them, pretend that you have diarrhea and you don't want to wet your pants with the diarrhea. Clamp down to prevent the diarrhea from coming out. And they'll clamp, they should be able to clamp down on your finger. How come? Because the external anal sphincter is voluntary. And so that's uh, you know, part of S3. Cauticoin is S3 nerve root. Bladder is S3. So these nerve roots might be injured. They might not be able to clamp down. So that would just increase the urgency of getting them to uh, an emergency room. Okay. Cauticoin center, we just talked about that. So... Yeah, medical emergency, bilateral, especially if it, they have bilateral lower extremity pain, they have numbness and tingling or burning anywhere in the perineal region, they have a history of incontinence or hesitancy. Uh, from my experience, I've run into several of these cases. It's always hesitancy. Uh, well, it's not always, but the complaints I get and the ones you can do something about is that, God, I can't go to the bathroom. It takes me 15 minutes to go to the bathroom. Now, it could be BPH that we're starting to talk about in the lecture portion of the class. Um, but it could be called equine, especially if they have bilateral. It's not good when people come in with bilateral radiating leg pain, especially if they're equal strength. Okay, so now we're ready to go in a little deeper. So we've checked out the anal canal, and it looks good. So now we need to go in the rectum. So have your patient relax again, and then just slide your finger in. Remember, it's your index finger. Slide it in there as far as you can go. Unless you have gigantic hands, then you don't uh, need to go that far. But for the normal and small size hand, you want to put it in there as far as you can. Uh, and then you're going to palpate the, the rectum. Um, basically, by that, by that same mechanism, you're going to rotate around. You can feel around. And you're looking for bumps and painful areas. Could be fistula. Could be a cancerous nodule. Who knows? But you need to search for it and make sure nothing's there. It should be smooth, right? You shouldn't feel any bumps or lumps anywhere. All right. So there's our picture. We're rotating around. Where's the prostate? Oh, the prostate's underdrawn. The prostate's much bigger than that. It's probably like that would be better. Okay, again, it should feel smooth. It should not be painful. I already said that. Internal hemorrhoids, uh, they can be painful if they have little blood clots, if they have venous stasis. Um, they, they can be painful. Uh, so it's probably the most common thing you'll run into, especially in long-distance truck drivers or anybody who has to sit for really long periods of time. Right, we do need to know what, who, what's the origin of these hemorrhoids because there's internal and external hemorrhoids. I usually do ask this question, so make sure you 
know this. So the external hemorrhoidal plexus usually makes hemorrhoids that just hang right out really easy to come out. The ones that are deeper are from the internal hemorrhoidal plexus usually. You could get them from this middle rectal, inferior rectal, superior rectal vein. Not as likely though. These plexuses are the ones that uh, become venous static and they overload with, with pressure. All right, there's an example of an internal. So a patient may have no idea that they have this until you go in there with your finger and you run right into it. Uh, so those are internal hemorrhoids. External hemorrhoids will be more coming from the outside of the anus. Uh, cancerous masses, polyps could be in this region. Rectal shelves are, I mean, that's cancer of the peritoneum. I think we're actually looking at rectal shelves a little more. So the anterior rectal shelf, uh, the anterior, uh, the anterior rectal wall at this depth does contain parietal peritoneum. So you could get cancer anywhere in the abdominum, cancerous cells kind of draining down in that region, and cancer could take off in that region, and um, especially in females. Uh, so this would be called a, a rectal shelf as the cancer grows. So here's an example. It's this is a sagittal view from the side. Here's the sacrum back here. There's the sacrum. Um, there's the rectum. Prostate is up here. Uh, but we haven't got to the prostate. You can do this on females too. So you, you put your finger in there, and lo and behold, you shouldn't run into anything. Even if you have big fingers, you should. You, there's a long way to go. You shouldn't run into something like this. If you run into something... On the, especially on the anterior wall here of the rectum, um, that could be filled with cancer, right? There's the, there's the rectovesicular pouch, which is normally more of a potential space. Um, but yeah, that can fill up with cancer cells and you can get a cancer. Uh, so that's called a rectal shelf. Rectal shelf equals cancer. All right. Let's see, because we're really out of time, aren't we? Yeah. Um, but we need to go through this. So I'm just going to keep going, so this will spill over to our hour tomorrow. And I usually go long on this, but I don't know what to do. We gotta, you got to have this to graduate, right? So if you're female, you're all done. Uh, so that's awesome. But if you're a guy, we have to keep going and check the prostate. So uh, maybe I can get this in here. We're not. We're almost done. Uh, so yeah, prostate is walnut size. We already know where it is. There's a nice little picture of it right here. Seminal vesicles are up here. Actually, they're closer on the back of this thing. Um, but yeah, there's the sacrum. Right. So uh, before you push your finger to this region, before you go poking around and push on this prostate, it, it makes the patient feel like they have to urinate. So warn them or they're going to get scared. So just tell them, okay, now this might make you feel like you have to urinate, so uh, that's fine. Nothing, and don't tell them this because nothing should come out. They shouldn't urinate. But sometimes if, if they have prostatitis and they have pus and stuff inside the prostate and juice, you might actually get some juice coming out the penis. That's why your right hand's got to be ready to catch that juice and, and put it in a test tube or petri dish, and it's got to be cultures to see what it is. Okay, now sweep your finger back and forth over the anterior wall of the rectum. Okay, and that's where the prostate is. And uh, you're, you're gonna, your finger's going to be kind of hooked. And I'll show you when we do this class. But your finger's kind of hooked like this. Like here's your... Oh, jeez. There's your hand. There's your thumb. So you... And we're just better draw a couple more fingers. There's another finger. Another finger because it's our index finger. There's your thumb, back of the nail. Uh, so you hook your finger like this and keep it stiff like that, and then you can jam it in there. Well, not jam it in there, but you can push a little harder with your finger kind of hooked like that. But you're going to sweep back and forth over the left and right lobes and medium lobe, and you're going to look for bumps. There shouldn't be any bumps. It should be smooth. The prostate, when you push on it, should feel like 
one of those erasers you can buy, a number two eraser. Actually, the ones that you can buy, the little rectangular bars of erasers. That's what it should feel like. It shouldn't be gigantic either. That's like BPH if it's huge. It should be fairly hard and difficult to palpate. And uh, shouldn't feel super boggy or soft either. That's a sign of BPH as well. Uh, so consistency should be the number two eraser. And um, yeah, you should not be able to feel the seminal vesicles at all, right? Unless they're full of cancer. Rarely they can become inflamed and be sore or tender. Remember, the cancer is not going to be painful. The BPH is not going to be painful. If they have prostatitis, if it is inflamed, that might be painful. But you shouldn't be able to feel the seminal vesicles. Okay, there's we already know that. I just did the anatomy on that yesterday. There they are again. Oh, yeah, we'll get through this. A lot of pictures. Um, so, yeah, shouldn't be painful. That could be prostatitis if it's painful. Uh, it shouldn't be hard nodules. That's prostate cancer, and we'll, we'll demonstrate that. In fact, to get out of the class, you got to tell me, is it normal or is it cancer? You will be tested on your 10 prostate. You have to do 10 prostate exams, and then you have to be tested. Um, yeah, it shouldn't stick out. Everything I said shouldn't stick out. It shouldn't protrude more than one centimeter. I mean, that's not realistic, I don't think, to, to know that. But it shouldn't be very, very palpable. Uh, it shouldn't feel spongy or boggy. That's uh, benign prosthetic hyperplasia, BPH. Pretty tough to tell, though, I think. Uh, prostate secretions, there's no juice should normally come out. And if it does, you should collect any juice that comes out of there. And yeah, so that's it. We're done with the exam. You say, okay, Mr. Jones, or we're all set. You pull your finger out. Now, if you're doing occult blood work, you're going to have some stool. You're going to have some fecal material on your finger, so don't waste it. You might as well put it in a Petri dish, collect it, and test it for occult blood. Maybe it's got a cancerous polyp. It's just leaking blood so little that he would never see it in his stool, but you can test it, test for it. It could save his life, right? Everybody over, not sure what the recommendation, I think it's still 40. Uh, 35 wouldn't be a bad idea, I don't think. Okay, so it's all over. Give the patient a Kleenex or towel to clean up with, and well, they might feel a little weird after the exam down there, uh, but that will pass within a couple hours. All right, we did it. See you later.